In Succession, Emmy winner James Cromwell plays Ewan Roy, estranged brother of media titan Logan Roy in HBO's epic drama. It leads the field with 18 nominations, and one of those nominations is for Mr. James Cromwell himself. I'm here with him. I'm Rob LeCouria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby. Congratulations on your Emmy nomination this year. Thank you kindly. So, check in the eye. <laughs> it sure is. Where were you when you found out about it? Were you expecting it? No, no, I didn't. No, they had told me a long time ago that they put me up, and I thought, well, fat chance. So, um, which is the way that's the way my Academy Award nomination. I mean, I, I, some guy, some sound engineer said, you know, that's an Academy Award uh, winning performance. I said, oh, come on, man! I got seventeen lines. He said, no, believe me, it's an Academy Award. So, so I, I did the, I, you know, I hired a publicist, did all the, but I thought, oh, geez, what? I just thought, well, what the hell? It's this is the only chance I'll ever get. And then I was doing a picture with Milos Forman. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it, the, he he came to me while we were working and said, you know, you 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 got to nominate it. <laughs> it's amazing. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I will we'll hopefully talk about Babe soon, but I must say, when you were nominated for that uh, Academy Award, um, just to see Farmer Hobbit there at the Academy Awards was such a thrill. It, it wasn't really expected, but wow, it was a really grateful. But we'll hopefully get a chance because that that must be one of your highlights. Really um, all right, so Succession, do you, know, do you often hear that people love the show, they're obsessed with it? But do you value that kind of engagement from fans and peers in something that you're part of? Um, well, as with the rest of my career, I get just the amount of, um, I wouldn't call it adulation, recognition of my work that I can handle. I am not overwhelmed by it. I get it rarely but at really nice times i'll be in new york walking in new york and somebody will stop and say hey oh man you're on you're on success oh, you're great on that and i always watch what you do and so i think wow that's great it's it's indicative not everybody wants to do that some people are embarrassed by that especially in this society we don't acknowledge each other very often um and it's that's very it's very nice i think they understand that what i do is work i'm not a celebrity um they're not watching me on you know on i don't know whatever those websites are and yeah and I, I, I they just see me and they know me and the things that i've been in they've usually liked i've been lucky that way um and they like this show a lot yeah uh, people really do love the show actually it's really taken off especially in season two and i always wonder you know it's about repugnant one percenters unlikable people but for whatever reason i want to be around them i want to watch them and other people seem to care about them too why do you think this show is so powerfully successful and why, why do people love it so much i would hope that um even though it's very, uh, very uh, well written. Um, the structure is wonderful. The characters are wonderful. The performances are, the acting company is extraordinary. Um, it's beautifully shot. So everything is there. And there are these people like celebrities about whom we know very, very little about how they live and how they think. And what the, and it's a, it's, it's a satire which we don't in America do very much of because it usually goes right over our head satire. Uh, no irony in the American, <laughs> in the American uh, ethos. Um, so um, I think they look at it and they, it, it sort of um, confirms their estimation of the ruling class that really it's only it's only the way it's presented by by the uh, corporate media, where they are, where they are elevated somehow. You know, you see Jeff Bezos, Bezos and all those people. What's his name from Facebook? And you think, oh, yeah. they're sort of gods. They're presented like gods. You know, everybody in the in the Senate and the House, they all bow down to them. You know, and it's oh my gosh. And then you realize, man, they're just. They're human beings. They're as venal, they're as confused, they're as small-minded, they're as mixed up, they're as they're as 
patently ignorant of how the rest of the people in the world live and do things. And it's always, uh, it's an affirmation to say, you know, it ain't so good up there with those people. Those people are messed up, man. They, they, they really are messed. And they are really messed up. Um, I had done, are you in, uh, are you in uh, Sydney or in Melbourne? Sydney. Because I had done a, pl I had done a play um, a little while back now uh, about Murdoch. Yeah. About which I think this family is, um, is, it's patterned after the Murdochs. And interestingly enough, now that we know more about the Trumps too. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as with Maxwell and, and Packer and all those people, uh, they're a strange bunch. Man. <laughs> I, don't yeah. I don't know what to say. They're, they're really strange. And yet they just well, seem to have, power is strange. Yeah, they have so much influence, unfortunately, or, or depending on what side of the aisle you sit on, so much influence on the way the world works these days. And I think that's something, it's like we're looking behind the veil, so to speak, with this show, and we see, actually, they're all super messed up. <laughs> so you're right, it is, it's almost kind of validating to say, like, you know, at least I'm not as bad as them, perhaps, I don't know. <laughs> uh, usually that's when, that, that's what happens, you know, it, two kinds of filmmaking. One, that you look at, sort of uh, objectively and say, well, I, I don't do that. I can't be as, they're really messed up. And the other, of course, where, where the work holds the mirror up to all of us and we see ourselves, hopefully with some, usually with compassion, not because when you make judgments, even about these people, you are of course setting yourself up because we are all responsible. We are all part of this. We are all contributory. We're all on the same train. The train is running out of control along a line towards a, a bridge that doesn't exist anymore. And we are all going to go into the ravine because we can't stop. Uh, and if you say that, say, oh, those are the people who are driving the train there in the first class cabin, but oh, they're really weird. No, we're on the train too. So I, I prefer the films. I really like the films where ordinary people look at other people where, wherever they're usually, usually it's not a difference of class. It's, it's a, it's a same, wherever it is, the problems are human and they evoke our compassion and our sympathy and our understanding and our willingness to take responsibility. That's of course, what's lacking in all these people. People in power refuse to look inside, to acknowledge like Lear, that they are also human when stripped of all the money and the power and the accoutrement and the, and the trappings of power they are unaccommodated man standing alone like all of us and we must reach out and hold the hand that is there um, otherwise it's a very dark journey yeah it's so true and that's why Often this show is compared to great um, iconic works of Shakespeare and so forth because it does have those uh, underlying themes, um, which which bring. There's always, and I, I'm sure that this has come up in um, that when you've had other interviews, but that's what brings me to Ewan because every story like this does have that moral compass or the person that we kind of look to as the outsider looking in, kind of as our surrogate. Is Ewan that person in this show? I think so. Uh, and it's interesting, I was thinking because uh, I was thinking about this uh, while I was doing something else here about uh, the succession and the awards. And then, um, he really is like Kent. Yeah. I, I, think, I, think he, I think he has familial feelings. I think he would like his brother to awaken. I think he'd like his brother to understand that the world does not revolve around him. He's learned something. He learned because he was passed over. Because after his stint in Vietnam, however, he came back and he was obviously wounded by, literally and figuratively, by that experience. I think his father, like Trump's father, who disowned his, passed over his elder, eldest son yeah. and went to the Donald, uh, I think, uh, I, I think he, he, first of all, feels um, passed over and, and what that must, the hurt that that must be, but also to see what it has done to the family, what he is, 
the, the illness that he is passing on, his ambition, his avarice, um, his, um, his lust for power uh, is, is corrupting. And I, there's nothing I can do. I can, I, can, I, can, I can keep saying it, but I can't do anything. So I think he cares like Kent cares for Lear. Yeah. But he says, well, see, look again, Lear. See, see what you are doing. Uh, that he keeps saying that. And he's not perfect. Kent is not perfect. Kent has a temper. Kent has limitations. We all, we all do. Shakespeare says we all do. We're, we're all in this together. We all, we're all, all complicit. Edgar is complicit. As compli to me, he's as complicit as Edmund is, if people know the story of Lear. Yeah. Um, he just recognizes something because of what he goes through. I think my character recognizes something because of what happened to him in Vietnam, what he saw, which was appalling. Mm. Appalling, a ho the horror, as, as Brando's character in Apocalypse says, the horror, the horror, that's what he saw. And that gives him this added dimension because uh, on any other show that maybe isn't as well written or, or not as nuanced, y Ewan would be the guy that has a grudge and he just hates Logan and resents him, but there's so much more to it, which we see in the episode eight, which is the episode submitted for your performance. Yeah. In, that, in that episode, um, Logan and family are back in Scotland and Logan is taking a tour of the university and it's a really phony, grotesque tribute to a, the man of the people, which is complete bullshit. And obviously you and C's right through that. You get some really great lines. Talk, talk us through what your highlight was from that episode. <laughs> My highlights. Well, it's an interesting thing. First of all, they, I think, that their idea was the character that you just spoke of. A man with full of sour grapes and resentment and smallness and, and bitter, bitterness, embittered. Yeah. And I said to Jesse in the dressing room when I first got there, I said, I really need to speak to Jesse because I, I said to him, you can't do that. You can't do, you can't make him dark and have him go to a Vietnamese restaurant and eat noodles and see his brother on the television. You, you have to acknowledge that this something's happened to, and I can't invalidate that. Yes, they'll know that I got passed over. Yes, they'll know that, yes, there's resentment and sorrow, but they will know that there's something bigger. I can't give that up. I can't, I can't do a character that compromises that. We talked for about an hour, bless his heart, he agreed which was really a color, just a color. It didn't change much of anything. A few lines got changed, but mostly it was because I do change those lines to fit what I think is the character that I want to present. So we, it, I did it and I loved it and I love doing it. Uh, I, I'm, I, I think they're, it's the most wonderful company. They're just fucking brilliant. And um, they have a tendency, <laughs> which is true of most shows like this, that they, keep changing the script uh, <laughs> right up until the, and I'm a, I'm a little bit of a, I don't know. I, I have to, I have to sit with a, a long time. It takes me a long time to ingest it and get it so that I feel comfortable. My, my mother, who was a wonderful actress, one of my mothers, but they were both great actresses, but one of them said to me, you got to know your lines when you're in front of a camera as so that you can do them backwards you have to you have to inhabit them you can't be thinking oh geez what a, let me see do i say did, was it that line or that one because you're then you then you miss it and i have a sort of a tendency to be a good boy and try to do it right and when i don't do it right i get really down on myself so that one scene <laughs> that i think they've chosen uh it was um it was Logan's birthday, real, it was really, uh, uh, it was his real birthday. Yeah. And uh, we were at a restaurant and, I, uh, and, and just came up to me and said, uh, so you like the direction that the uh, character, you like this now? I said, yeah, you know, no, it's great, it's great. I love it, it's terrific. And he said, yeah, because we worked on it, da 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 da. And then I went home and there was a new script. <laughs> and I was shooting, I was shooting tomorrow. So I had this big, long monologue. And not only that, it was in front of the entire cast. 
I mean, if I was going to screw up, I was going to screw up in front of everybody. And, uh, and I had just had my um, knee replaced. <laughs> so I couldn't walk very well. So I had to find out how am I going to sit? And then, of course, I'm tall. Yeah. And they, and they have to get us both in the same shot. So I figured <laughs> out a way to sit down at the table. So I was uncomfortable as anything. And I don't know the lines. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, it, was the, it was one of the worst days ever, ever. But that has happened to me a number of times. Uh, interestingly enough, I, I, I got uh, recognition for uh, um, Angels in America, a uh, yeah. scene I did with Al Pacino. And I was so nervous that my mouth dried. I had eaten the wrong, uh, I'd eaten Indian food. And it, it some spice dried my mouth out. And then I'm doing it. They, Mike Nichols said, we're, we're going to do uh, Al's uh, thing first because he has this long model. And he gets, has to get dressed from his underwear. He puts his shirt on, his yeah. vest on, get it, put in, and then he cuts a cigar. And, and we did it for a day. And Al never made a mistake. And then, of course, Mike says, OK, next tomorrow's you. And I go to do it. And I am so nervous that I cannot. I cannot even write. I want to write on my clipboard. And I cannot remember a bloody one. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just gritting. I am so, I'm gritting my teeth. And every time we go off to start the scene, Hal reaches over and pats me on the shoulder and says, it's, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and I thought they were going to fire me. And it turned out that he, that he used that scene. That was the scene that they used in every promo and for every reviewer to see because I had misinterpreted the character. I thought my character as a doctor was, I know you're not, this is not on the subject. But. No, but it's fascinating. I, it was fascinating. So, you know, it's my genius. My genius is that when I screw up, <laughs> it's usually... It usually works out better. Memo to future directors and writers for um, Mr. Jamie Cromwell. You've got to, they've got to put you in a very bad predicament for you to really shine. So that's true. That's right. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> oh, yes. So, you know, I think ultimately that's Ewan's power. He can see through Logan and sees his bullshit. But um, yeah. before we let you go, uh, as promised, we must talk about Babe. 25 year anniversary, you're opposite Australian national treasure for our American viewers who don't know her, Magda Zubansky, one of the greatest comedic actresses of all time. And uh, you get to do a really great um, performance as Farmer Hoggett, nominated for an Oscar. It was one of the highlights for all us Oscar watchers. What was the highlight of that night sitting in that auditorium and hearing your name being called as an Oscar nominee? Uh, the sweetness of it is that the show looks one way on when you watch it on the television but every time they cut to a commercial people get up and go talk to other actors i was sitting right in front of uh brad pitt and that other wonderful english actor who was in uh uh is it rob roy or oh uh yeah oh it's short, short guy, wonderful. One, if you played the, the villain, they had a duel. Yes. And they, they were right in front of us. And people would come up and acknowledge us and, you know, say how nervous my, my friend Richard Dreyfus came up and said, I have, he was nominated for Best Actor. He said, I have just enough hope to be miserable. <laughs> and, and, and I looked at Brad Pitt and sweat is running down his face. <laughs> And they announced we're the first ones up. And of course, they got a camera right in their face because they want, they hope that you go, when the, the, another name is announced, they hope you go, oh, yes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> they just catch that. And they announced, and of course, Kevin got up and did his thing. And Brad turned around to me and said, I feel a lot better now. <laughs> and I said, Yeah, I do too. <laughs> because we didn't have to go up there and yeah. do the dance. Oh. But it's, so I was, I was real delighted with the community of actors. I was delighted for Chris um, because I loved him. And, uh, and it was his picture from front to back. It was not George's picture. George's picture was number two. It's a wonderful picture, but it's a completely different sensibility. The heart in Babe is Chris's. 
yeah. uh, Chris and and Magda and the, everybody and uh, I just went along for the ride and it, I had a the most beautiful. I had the most beautiful culmination of that whole event. I I I, I would get made up every day by a woman, a wonderful uh, uh, English. Uh, she had worked for the BBC, but I never and she had all the news on the set. So she, so I never looked at my makeup, and I just assumed she's doing it and it's going to be fine, and. We did this last scene where the pig takes the sheep around through the course and then I, into the paddock and I close the door and it goes click and the crowd goes wild. And it, it went so magnificently. It went without a hitch, first take. It was unbelievable. I closed the door and the 200 people on the reviewing stand from the local community went busy because they had never seen sheep, 12 sheep march in unison. They couldn't believe it. And I, we set up for the close up, and and I said, to, I knew what I wanted to do. I said to Chris, where, where should I take this? He said, mm, take it right into the lens. So, I looked at the lens. I wasn't in it, you know. I looked. Okay, yeah, I can do that. So, the shot came. I closed the door. The little pig was next to camera. I looked right down the lens, and the lens was a big had a big. Uh, uh, lens cover on it, and I could see my reflection in the lens, but it wasn't me. It was my father, and my father was a director and an actor, and I always wanted to live up to his expectation and to the kind of career that he had made for himself. He was, as Kaye described, he was a gentleman's director, and I looked at the thing and I said, That'll do, pig. That'll do. And what I heard was, that'll do, Jamie. That'll do. And I, <laughs> to be acknowledged after doing that, I, I loved every minute. I loved that crew. I loved Australian. Loved Chris. Got to know George. It was so dear to me in the second one. Um, it's why I loved going back. Uh, I just did a film and a television series. Um, uh, and uh, it's always a delight. It's a, the, the no worries uh, it, philosophy is just the best in the world. Man. It sure is. That's, that's, that's something that we live by. Um, everybody go to Gold Derby, make your predictions uh, and watch all of our great contender chats just like this one with James Cromwell. James, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, man. My pleasure.